Thank you so much for clicking on this video of a care collab for the Epidendrum Parkinsonianum or Coilostylus Parkinsoniana. And today, teaming up with me is Terry from TD More Than Just Orchids to talk about our beautiful Coilostylus Parkinsoniana. I bought her as Epidendrum Parkinsonianum. That's how she sticks in my head. I will be using Coilostylus Parkinsoniana as much and as best as I can for future reference because I think that is also a pretty name. There's a lot of distraction and noise behind this video because this orchid is quite difficult to film. Clearly we're talking about <laughs> the one in bloom right in front here. And we'll get into a growth habit a little bit later on, but look, you see, um, yeah, this one's not easy to present and film, especially when she's in bloom like this. And that is because of the way the blooms grow out. Basically, she is an epiphyte that can be found from Southern Mexico throughout Central America down to Panama. Her pendant growth habit screams, the best option of growing this orchid is mounting. I have her in self-watering with Lekka. We'll get to that as well. It is a widespread, relatively uncommon species, which normally grows in pine oak forests at elevations of 1,500 meters all the way up to 2,300 meters. And that makes this orchid a great, great orchid to have in a collection because of the temperature range. That would be six degrees Celsius, 30 degrees Celsius. Perfect for my climate here in Southern Spain. I've had this orchid now four years. Actually, this is her fourth year with me. And up until now, I used to always bring her indoors during the winter months when the outdoor temperatures drop below 13 degrees Celsius. But this year will be the first year she's going to stay outside all year round. And she's going to be graduating to the mature orchid that she is that doesn't need the babying and the coddling and the protection during the cold winter months, which is a relief because moving her in and out every day during the winter days that are gorgeous outside, that is a bit of a headache again because of her pendant growing nature. She is not an unruly orchid. If I were to grow her mounted, then she would just hang somewhere and grow. This growing in the pot culture is a completely different ball game. And that is why I prefer her now just to stay outside where she lives and has her permanent home on the top shelf of my blooming alley facing south. Whether she's in bloom or not, that is her space. And that is where she can have direct sun throughout the months of September through May. Because of the angle of the sun being lower in the sky during those months, she will get dappled direct sun through the trellising. Now during the hotter months of the year, June, July, August, she gets extremely bright shade, no direct sun. Again, because the sun is much higher in the sky. The reason for my setup of Lekka and self-watering is that she prefers to have a humidity factor of 55% to 75%, which I can do for the colder months of the year, but then it drops radically during the hotter months of the year. And then the question is, can I keep up with her watering? The hottest months of the years normally is what they would consider a rest period. Well, in my climate, that really isn't the case because I can't give her the humidity that she would live off of in the ambient of where she naturally grows. So I do water all year round, but I do stop fertilizing when she's not in active growth. And I just flush regularly and keep my pot nice and damp, not letting my microfiber dry out at any given time. She starts actively growing for me again late fall and develops the new growth throughout the winter months. And then they mature in early spring. And that is where I fertilize her at 160 parts per million. Every single time she absorbs the reservoir. And before I fill up that reservoir, I do flush the pot with plain RO water just to make sure that I don't get any accumulating salts. When she arrived in my collection, I got a lot of orchids in very, very fast. So she's still in a pot that has dirty leca. And you can see that the moss and everything that is on top there, that is a result of dirty leca. Right at the beginning, I did not like it because you can see how skinny her growths are, and I didn't want them to be rotting away in the pot while I'm trying to transition her into this Lekka and self-watering. So I sprayed the moss with hydrogen peroxide. That killed it, but it made the pot on the top look really nasty for quite some time. Slowly but surely, it, it is starting to grow back. 
but that is dirty lecker in her pot. However, I am reluctant to change that. I'm reluctant to go in right now. She's been here with me. Again, this is my fourth year. I normally say do not let a self-watering lecker pot go unattended for more than three years. But I'm reluctant to go in there because right now she's doing quite well. I'm seeing new root growth around the pot. I'm going to leave her as is. Those roots are quite fine. There's not a lot of them. And when I flush her through, I can see that the pot itself has a great climate in it. When I fill the reservoir to give her a silicon soak, I can see I've got gargling and bubbles going. So the oxygen exchange in that pot is okay. And I'm okay with that. I have no intentions at this point in time of going in there and repotting. Once the growth mature in early spring, slowly but surely the sheaths will start to look a little bit more fatter, more chubbier. And underneath those papery sheaths, she will be developing buds that you don't necessarily see at first because they are very, very tightly packed, growing along the line of the leaf, really hugging the leaf. And if you don't peek under the sheath, you won't know that anything's happening until one day buds appear and then you know she's going to bloom. I have stopped trying to look under my sheaths. <laughs> it used to be very tempting, but those are there for a reason, to protect those buds, especially because they are hugging the leaf so tightly that if there's any rain or something coming on the orchid, which wouldn't be the case in my case because she lives under cover, but in the outdoors, if there were to be rain or something, those sheaths protect the buds from getting too wet and then not developing. The blooms are gorgeous to say the least. They are about 50 centimeters from top to bottom and across another 10 centimeters, 12. They can even get bigger than this. They are very, very fragrant. Late at night, probably about 10 p.m. until 10 a.m. in the morning, even during daylight, but very fragrant at night. And then when you wake up in the morning, she still has her fragrance. And it reminds me of a very dull lily of the valley. Not as pungent, not as strong, very, very pleasant. And you don't have to get close to her to smell her either. She's, you can smell that fragrance from at least a meter away from her. There's no, there's no doubt who's playing when she is in bloom. The blooms also are extremely robust. They have a waxy texture to them. The lip that juts out is also quite waxy. There's nothing flimsy about it. And I also love the scaly look of the spike itself. When you touch it, it has a little bit of a texture to it that is very, very interesting. The bloom duration of this orchid is what makes it a keeper as well. Two months, at least. Last year, I got almost three months out of these blooms. That makes this orchid a very, very popular one in my collection. Everything about this orchid, I love her growth habit, the pendant growth. I have now no issues with her. She is very, very easy to propagate and we'll get to that as well. So when I spoke about propagation, here we are taking you off the tripod, getting a little bit closer. You can see how this part here, this is a third lead and it's not too happy. It looks like maybe from moving it around during the winter, it got a kink in it. You can see it's right there, but it's still surviving. So this one, for example, is where I could take it off. When I see new roots growing on this piece, it's tiny, just goes to here. When I see this piece growing new roots, I can nip it off right there and then start a separate plant. If that happens, I'm gonna mount it and then we shall see. Last winter, she started also on this growth, which is another lead coming in right at the base of the plant that is always welcome. And it was heading in the opposite direction of the pot, which is not good. <laughs> that makes it even more difficult to handle this orchid. So once the growth was long enough, I took the leaf and then I bent it over and supported it to keep it in the direction that I need it to grow so that I can actually have her in a pot on a shelf. So this growth objected to that. It didn't die off, but you can see clearly it was not happy. It, it would have preferred to go in the other direction. So there was no blooms coming out of there. The other pieces that have bloomed is a new growth that's right here, which has dried off. I believe that is possibly fertilizer burn. It is not dry air, seeing as these growths matured during the winter. So that's possibly fertilizer burn. 
I was doing 160 parts per million, it's possible that that was a little bit too much. Or my other conclusion is I knocked it. One of the two. The other growth that has bloomed is gorgeous, long, and then to the tip down there. You can see how the growth habit makes this orchid get longer and longer and longer, and that's why mounting it would make a lot more sense. Or putting it on a tree. When I spoke about light influx, I want to show you a little bit of freckling. Let's go down here. A little bit of freckling is good. This is still okay as well. There's nothing wrong right here, even though it's already a bit darker. We go to the next stage of darkness, to the right of it. That's all right as well. That shows the orchid is getting enough light. When it looks like this, that's too much. And you'll see from the picture where she lives that when the angle of the sun comes through that trellising, which is actually the west side, then this leaf gets hit. I'll take it, I don't mind. As long as there's plenty of foliage on this orchid, that is okay. I don't mind actually having a few that may look like this. That's okay. The other ones are perfectly fine. Now you can also get three blooms per spike. I've never managed that. I've only ever managed two, but I do have three blooms to show for this year. Here I want to show you the wafer thin coating that I spoke of before. It is very, very delicate and it has these beautiful like little patternings that you would see on some boho linen on it. Very cool. Also down here, it's like a little lace structure around the buds, protecting them as they grow. And this is definitely something I never take off. I think it looks beautiful. It adds to the charm and it is a protection even though now they're in bloom. The next growth I'm anticipating, there's one peeking out right here, which is great because of the pot, getting more roots into the pot. Otherwise, other growths will start on a pendant level down here, making the orchid eventually even longer. So I'm really pleased that she is going to be able to live outside permanently from now on, and I don't have to keep moving her with the exception of the maintenance and the watering, the flushing and all that. But thank you so much, Terry from TD More Than Just Orchids for joining me on this care collab. I hope that the distractions in the background weren't too annoying. And I'm not talking about the distractions of my other orchids, the noise pollution. I appreciate your time. If you have any questions regarding this orchid that I didn't cover, please ask away in the comments below. If you have this orchid and you want to join us on future Care Collab videos, updates, or your version of care and what you do, Please leave me a comment below as well and we shall be in touch and get you on board for future updates. Have yourselves a wonderful day, everybody. I appreciate your time. Really, really do. Please stay safe and take care. Bye.